Okay, so I'm being told we're ready to start. Um, can someone confirm that you can hear me and this is all good? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, Um, hang on, let me just sort my screen. Okay, perfect. Um, hey everyone, I'm Kira. I'm gonna be talking about characterization and how to use it strategically in debates. Uh, thank you for watching or at least starting to watch, I guess. You might turn it off if you don't think this is useful, but thank you for starting. Um, I'm gonna talk about characterization in a way which I, in a like structure which I think is quite logical. So I'll start with what is characterization, how to come up with effective characterization, um, how to build effective characterization in your speeches, um, how to weaponize it, how to practice it, then how to rebut it. And then at the end, just kind of tips that have kind of generally helped me and I think make quite a big difference. Um, thank you to the people who already put questions on the Google form. That was really, really helpful. And I've integrated those questions into this talk. So I'll hopefully flag up when I'm answering your question. If you have any more, feel free to, if you're on Zoom, just put it in the chat. And if you're on YouTube, just comment it and then someone's gonna send it to me and I'll probably answer them at the end just to make sure I can flow okay. Um, so yeah, thank you. So I think just to start with kind of why I chose to talk about characterization and why I think it's important. Um, I think that at its core, characterization is about how to illustrate what the world looks like, how to paint a picture of what the world looks like, and then how to use that conceptualization to make your arguments as effective as possible and to really stick in the round. Um, and I think when I was kind of, I would say stuck in a rut and felt like I wasn't really improving, I didn't really know how to get better. I think characterization was the thing that I was missing and made a big difference to me. So I think you can have arguments and reasons and impacts, but often if you're missing the ability to kind of paint a picture and show the judge what the world actually looks like, it's just very hard to make the other parts of debating and other parts of arguments stick. And I think like debates are won and lost based purely on characterization um, a lot more than we realize and potentially even like more than judges realize because often the credibility that you give to an argument or the way in which you you know value an argument or see the argument interacting with the debate depends on how clearly you can conceptualize what the argument is trying to do which often depends on the characterization of what the world looks like and therefore how this will play out so i think this is a massively important skill I also think, especially given the kind of recent trend of CA setting motions, which are very abstract, so anything to do with narratives, glorification, norms, kind of abstract concepts, these debates are essentially won or lost on characterization because you have so much scope to characterize what that phenomenon looks like. And then every single argument in the debate depends purely on that characterization. So I think it's particularly important given this context. Um, and especially in close debates, which teams characterize and which teams don't um, is a massive deciding factor in terms of who's most persuasive and plausible, even if everyone has like roughly similar arguments and similar mechanisms. So I think it really, really makes a difference. Um, and I've never heard the feedback that someone characterized too much, as in like, you can definitely be repetitive, you can definitely waste time, you can definitely characterize the wrong things, but if you do it correctly, strategically, and in ways which keep adding value, it's very rarely not powerful, which is why I think it's a really important skill to talk about. Um, the next thing I'll say is I'm aware this is like a Euros prep lecture and there's only two weeks to Euros and this is obviously very opinion based but I do think that one of the biggest differences you can make to your speeches in terms of quality is focusing on characterization with a limited amount of time because it makes such a big differential between like a must speech and a very good speech, even with the same arguments, is how well you can kind of paint the picture of the world. Um, and because this is like a Euros prep lecture and I've been competing at um, like most of the Euros prep competitions, I'm also going to flag up some like common mistakes that I've been noticing and that judges have been saying that will hopefully be useful. Um, and this isn't to say that like I don't make those mistakes or like I'm above those mistakes, that is not the point of it at all. It's more just like these are trends that I think teams, including myself, are kind of consistently missing. So I'm going to try and identify them and talk about strategies that I've been thinking about of how we can rectify them and then make it more effective. Um, I'm also to do this, I'm going to use examples of debates that I've been in and use these strategies. Um, again, not because they're like amazing or the best examples, but because I think it's easier to explain my thought process to you if I can like give examples of when I've used these strategies and what that actually looked like, which hopefully makes this lecture a bit clearer because I know sometimes um, these kind of topics can be quite abstract and difficult to kind of see how you actually apply it to a debate rather than just debate theory. So I'm gonna try my best to mitigate that. Um, the final caveat, I guess I wanna say before I dive into the content is just to say that I'm going to give a lot of strategies that work for me, but just because they work for me doesn't necessarily mean they'll all work for you. I think that sometimes in these kind of lectures, we have a tendency, and I definitely, when I started watching them, had a massive tendency to assume that anything any like experienced debater said is like the word of God, and I had to, you know, write it all down and do it perfectly, um, which is just not true, because 
we all think we all see debates in different ways we all think in different ways um some things hopefully some things that i say you're going to find useful and are going to click but don't be scared to like dismiss things i say or disagree with things i say um because they, they worked for me they might not work for you just like try everything see what clicks and then you kind of find your own style so i'm hoping hoping that's what people can gain from this and um, lastly <clears throat> I think characterization overlaps with so many other concepts in debating. So contextualization, framing, comparatives, counterfactual, weighing, like characterization is intrinsic to all of these things. I'm gonna try and like stay away from using all this jargon because I think we often get kind of bogged down with using these words to describe certain things, um, which can be confusing because often they overlap. Um, but just to flag up that this lecture is definitely not just about characterization. I'm also gonna be talking about weighing, context framing because these things overlap. Um, but I'm going to try and do it in a way that is as clear as possible and not just kind of using the jargon. Cool. So just to start, so what is characterization essentially um, and how do we do it effectively? So like I said, characterization is kind of the basic idea of describing what the world looks like, what's the context of it, what are the actors, what does the situation look like? And that is massively important because it changes the terms of the debate. So it sets up your argument if you can prove that an actor or a phenomenon has particular qualities or interests. Um, therefore react in certain ways to certain policies or be significant in certain ways to the debate, which is really, really important. And I think a massively important point about characterization, which is sometimes missed, is that characterization analyzes how a phenomenon happens generally, as opposed to in one specific instance. So you can often prove that in one instance, an actor will do X, but it doesn't follow that in every analogous situation, they will always do X. Um, and characterization kind of tries to break this problem with using examples, which is saying just but like, why is this response true in all cases, and therefore stems through lots of scenarios we're debating about, rather than just one. So that's really important. So I think characterization matters because an, an effective way to characterize is using examples, but whereas examples can always just be contradicted with a counter example, it's much harder to dismantle characterization um, because you have to identify it, you have to rebut it, you have to construct a new characterization, you have to weigh your characterization against their characterization. So it's just much more likely to stick in the debate if you paint an effective picture that isn't just contingent on assertions about one thing happening in one case. So therefore either, I think the best strategies are first of all, A, characterizing what an actor or a phenomenon that's important to the motion is like in general. So what is the norm? Um, what, what is generally happening across space and time? Or B, characterize a specific subset of actors and make them the most important issue in the round and prove why they matter more than all the other things in the debate. So I'm gonna talk about both of these, of these strategies. Um, here I'm already talking about kind of characterizing actors and debates. And one of the questions I got on the Google forum was, is there a difference between actor analysis and characterization or is one of them part of another? So I just wanna flag that up here to say like, I mean, you probably can differentiate, but it's really not helpful to you. And then characterization is the part of actor analysis where you describe what the actors like, how they'll behave. Oh, so what the actors like, and therefore A, how they'll behave and B, why we should care about them. So this is the descriptive part. Um, but if you're running an argument about one particular actor in that, like it's it's critical that you have characterization, even though you always should, of course. Um, yeah, regardless of what that is. So that's particularly important. So I think the function of characterization and kind of making it general is to make arguments plausible um, and show why something will happen rather than just doing the mechanistic analysis of how it will happen um, and then what the impacts of it happening are. So for example, a lot of people use examples to prove points. So for example, someone saying like, the US poorly intervened in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, and therefore it will intervene badly in X place, just can be just counter example, counter, given a counter example to an intervention that wasn't terrible. So people might be like Kosovo, for example, kind of happen differently. So the comparison is if you give a strong characterization, you're giving the reasons behind that and painting the picture about why they invaded, uh, like the invasion went bad in Iraq and Afghanistan. So things like the US has bad incentives, maybe oil, there's political pressure to show dominance, lack of internal scrutiny, um, American hegemony controls big institutions that scrutinize it so they don't get made properly accountable. Um, other countries aren't willing to stand up to the US. Foreign policy isn't always a big feature in domestic politics. There's limited accountability, so leaders make bad decisions. This is all kind of description and painting a picture about why the US is likely to um, intervene badly, which back to that characterization of them being an unreliable actor in terms of characterizing. So I think it's therefore important for allowing you to access your impacts and arguments by showing that your conceptualization of the world is true and can be relied upon in the debate. Um, but the first thing I want to say is, even though I've kind of given this preamble, I think examples are very powerful, but I just think you have to be careful how you use them when you're characterizing. So I think the best examples that aid your characterization are examples which aren't restricted in space and time. So for example, 
if you say the US intervened clearly in Iraq, so it will do it again. That's just kind of one example. Um, but if you're able to give examples across time, so for example, in the past 100 years, the US intervened in 50 different regimes, um, you can give good intuitions based on a past trajectory or trend about how they will react in the future. That can't just be rebutted with one counter example. And similarly, you can do it across space, right? So you can be like, the US has four different military occupations, like, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, however many, um, and therefore it has a strong military presence. And this is what it's doing in these countries. And they identify common threads between them because it's much broader. It can't be as easily rebutted. So the example becomes much more powerful. So I think the best way to use examples in characterization isn't looking at specific instances or specific examples. It's looking at trends and patterns. So if you list times that Trump has been chaotic or you list like times religions have liberalized, that shows trends, which is a really good way of bolstering characterization, but doesn't just leave, it doesn't leave you as vulnerable to counterexamples. Obviously you can't do that, but it's much, it's much stronger. And I think this is actually the first big piece of advice I'd have if you're prepping for Euros, which is when you're researching facts or when you're matter prepping, don't research isolated instances, but research patterns and trends from which you can extrapolate effective characterization. So this is the difference between saying like having one really detailed IMF case study where it, it went badly versus saying like 98% or whatever percentage of the countries the IMF have given loans to have defaulted on their loans. Because the second well, characterization using the second example is much more persuasive um, and it's much more intuitive because it shows it across space and time. So that's kind of the role that I think examples should play in characterization. Um, but I do think that given this like using examples can still be powerful um just as long as you're not solely dependent on them for your characterization you're also kind of giving reasons um and giving more structural analysis which I'll, I'll outline later um but i think examples can really clarify characterization and kind of imprint what you're trying to say in the judge's mind very very clearly um so for example there's this this happens a lot in debate so i speak first and i often use like kind of very abstract language kind of technical terms don't use examples as much um, and then my partner refers back to my ideas and he'll do it in like, you know, a quarter of the time he'll sum up the same idea, but just give me an example of how it works. Um, and then everyone then refers to that point as related to that example. So, you know, in one debate I was talking about, it was about like Twitter and fact checking and verified tweets. And I was talking about how it affects social movements. And then my partner summed up my point by talking about the Me Too movement, how it affects the Me Too movement. And therefore henceforth in that debate and in the OA, everyone talked about it as like the Me Too point which I think shows the power of examples can have to make your characterization clearer. You just can't rely on them solely because they can so easily be counter rebutted. Um, so that's kind of the function that I think examples should have. It should show trends and patterns, A, and then B, crystallize your point and illustrate your point, just not, you do, can't rely on it to make the point, if that makes sense. That's kind of the first thing about examples. Um, but I think there are other strategic functions of characterization, which I'll get onto. Um, but I guess, okay, just take a step back. Um, let's just start by how you actually come up with characterization, which is strategic for your site. Because, so this isn't how to characterize, it's how to choose what you're going to characterize and how you're going to characterize them. I think sometimes it's obvious. Um, and if you think the characterization is obvious on your side of the motion, like back yourself and do it and be rigorous and believe it. So if you're giving an actor power, Obviously, you want them to be good, you want them to be competent, you want them to be well intentioned. Um, if you are putting sanctions on an actor, you obviously want them to be weak so that they'll respond to that sanctions. If you're like banning or regretting something, obviously, you're going to characterize that thing as terrible. Um, but sometimes it's not so obvious. So, in very complex debates, I would say like often IR debates, it's unclear which actors you want to characterize in which way so that your case works properly. And I think in these instances, the best advice is genuinely to work backwards because work out what your case is going to be work out what your point, work out what you're trying to prove, and then think, what are the implicit assumptions on which my point, my case is based? So I'm assuming X actor will act in X way, identify that, and then build the characterization around that, which lets you do it. Because often, so generally you characterize at the start of your speech or at the start of your point to kind of make it clearer. But I think a lot of times the, when you build characterization, it's most helpful to do it at the end of prep. So work out what your points are, and then from that, what are the implicit assumptions and what characterization can I give to convince the judges that those implicit assumptions were true about what the context is, what the actor is, what the situation is, et cetera, that will make that most plausible. So work backwards is basically my main advice if it's confusing and talk about how to generate it after your points. Um, I think this is quite a hard thing to do. Obviously, it's kind of like an intricate strategic call to make a case and then be like, what are the assumptions and then characterize on that basis. So I think the main advice that I'd give to you in terms of prepping this is that don't just practice it in the context of debates or in context of timed prep. 
like just give yourself motions, prep a case, and then just have a discussion with your partner or like sit by yourself and brainstorm what you think the characterization should be so that you have maximum time to do it. Um, because I think 15 minutes isn't enough time to do it properly. So you have to spend a lot of time working out how to have the skills and developing those skills so that then you can condense it into 15 minutes. But I think just practicing this in debates is quite inefficient. It's actually better just to focus on, just think about motions, think about what is the case? What are the assumptions? So how should I characterize these actors? And just practice doing that outside of other debates because using that skill will then help you develop it more intuitively when you are in a debate and then you have time pressure and you kind of know the stages to go through. That's my main advice about practicing. I actually think a lot of the things we practice shouldn't just be in time prep or in debates. It should just be like general skills, um, which is how I think you should do that. Um, but to move on, so that's kind of how to work out what you should characterize and what it should be. The next part is how to build characterization. And I think there are three components of strong characterization. One is description, two is justification, and three is implications. And I think normally people drop the last two and only describe the actor. They don't justify or do implications, um, which is harmful because your characterization a becomes redundant because the judges don't buy it or b is only implicitly significant so if you describe an actor but don't justify or explain what the implications of that actor being in that way are in the rest of the debate um it's very plausible the judges won't make that connection and work out what you were trying to say um which is why you have to be as explicit and clear as possible about what the not just what you characterize but what the purpose of your characterization was um because like 15 minutes or 20 minutes is just not long for a, a group of panelists to um think about a debate that was like an hour long which is why you have to be very very clear why you're doing it but just assume that because the complex ideas were there the judges will understand that you have to make it as easy for them as possible which is why i think justification and implications are very significant but what i'm going to do is i'm going to go through these three stages so description justification implications i'm going to go through each of them in turn and kind of give you kind of the prompts or the questions that i would ask myself and i'd advise you asking yourself when you're coming up with these um, in a way which i hope will be useful um so first of all description so obviously this is where you're using rhetoric, you're painting a picture, you're using adjectives to describe what your actor is like. Um, I think the best, it sounds obvious, but a line that someone said to me that really stuck with me was don't assert, describe. And it seems in, like counterintuitive because description kind of is assertion if you think about it. You're just asserting that thing is a certain way and then describing it. Um, but you need to basically give a level of detail and kind of paint an image that goes beyond just saying X has this interest or Y is unreliable, you have to describe what unreliable means and make it much more tangible and visible to the judges what that actually means. Obviously, you don't want to be too hyperbolic in your description. So like be rhetorical, but don't go crazy and kind of undermine yourself. Um, but be confident in your idea. I think a lot of the time it just takes confidence to characterize something in a very, very strong way, which often people are reluctant to do because they're not totally like sure it's correct or sure it's important. And it's it's you kind of have to take a leap of faith more than just kind of giving the same mechanisms in every debate to paint a really, really, really vivid picture. Um, but I think it's definitely something that's worth practicing and then worth doing rhetorically. Um, so I have a list of questions, which I think are things you should consider when you're describing the actor. First of all, it's just generally, who is the actor? What are they like? What do we know about their history? Has anything changed about them recently? Like just a general description of what they're like and the situation they're in, which obviously you have to adapt depending on what actor you're talking about and what the debate is. Um, so that's kind of the most general one, just paint a picture of the things you know that are significant. Uh, the second one is what are their interests? What are their incentives? What do they care about? What motivates them? Describe that, that's really important. The third one is what are their thought processes or decision-making processes? And I think this is one that again, often gets left out when we're characterizing actors because in debates, we tend to assume that everyone's rational and hence, if they have incentives and capacities, they will do the thing that's in their best interest. And I just think, based on my real life, maybe I'm just more rational than the average person, but I just think that's that's not true. And the most effective characterization is often ones which break this dichotomy of saying, it has this incentive, so it will do this. Um, I think there's a few ways to do this. I think when you're talking about individuals, a lot of this is intuition pump about painting pictures about how individuals respond in certain situations. So individuals who you know are very confused, have lots of emotions, are under stress and duress, feel very overwhelmed. Um, there's lots of reasons why people don't make, lots of psychological processes you can explain as to why people don't make the decision that's best for them, which is why consciously thinking about their thought process, what is impacting their thought process, is really, really important so that it doesn't become too simplistic by just saying, this is their incentive and this is what they want. Um, 
because we're not robots in debates, right? We have like complex minds, so you should unpack that. But I think the decision-making process applies just as much and possibly stronger to, you know, organizations, which are equally complicated and have different levels. Because again, in debates, we tend to characterize like phenomenon as set things like companies or countries are like an entity that we just treat as unitary, which makes no sense um, in the real world. Because, you know, just because it would be in a company's incentive to do X doesn't mean that that um, conforms to the incentives of each actor who's making that decision. So shareholders, workers, CEOs, managers all have different decision-making processes and calculuses to like the company as a whole. So I think if you can break that down, um, that's really important in terms of like breaking, like going more nuanced than just saying what their incentive is. So that's particularly important. And often you can like totally change the way, the intuition about actors if you unbox them and particularly focusing on like vulnerable groups within them. And um, because we tend to assume the decisions are made by the powerful. So if you're thinking like, you know, companies are like driven by profit and they do all these things, but actually if you focus on the workers in those companies and the degree of debatable, obviously degree of influence that they may or may not have, you can break the incentives equals action kind of deadlock by talking about different actors within them. So basically the point of this was just break down decision-making processes. Don't just rely on like incentives as like a very clear, easy to understand thing, because it's not. Um, I think this also applies to like countries as well, because we, again, we tend to think in debates about countries and all actors really in a very like rational calculated sense. So I, I'll give an example here, which is we always tend to analyze like the One Belt, One Road initiative as being like a rational calculus incentive for expansionism and think about it in a very like material sense. But I think there's a lot of like ideological, less depending on what rationality means, but less rational reasons um, why China might be doing this. So for example, you can talk about like the century of humiliation that China faced at the hands of Western colonial powers, having been cheated and exploited in the past. So therefore they have a kind of almost irrational drive to create a new order rather than operate within existing frameworks. So that's an ideological thing which influences thought, pro um, thought processes and decision-making processes, which is detached from just incentives and capacities. So it's just important to like break this paradigm basically. And I think that's how you kind of access a lot of more nuanced characterization tactics. Um, the fourth one, I kind of just alluded to it, but it's capacities. How do they operate? How much power do they hold? What trump cards do they hold? Why are they valuable in the debate? What's their significance? So for example, if you're talking about countries, who do they influence with their ally block? Um, what like commodities do they have? What strengths do they have? All these kind of things. Um, if you're talking about institutions, who do they have sway over? What's their jurisdiction? What's their control like? Um, if you're thinking about social movements, how much voting power do they have? How much credibility do they have? What's their sway? Just generally, what are their strengths? And therefore, why are they significant in the round? That's an important thing to characterize. But also, the flip side is what are their weaknesses? What challenges are they facing? And what are their vulnerabilities? Because those are also things which can equally exploit it in debate and then used to any team's strategic advantage, basically. Um, so for example, I think this becomes really, really important in basically any debate about children, because um, when you're talking about like their weaknesses and vulnerability, you can talk about, you know, their psychological processes, their cognitive abilities being less developed than the rest of the debate is dependent on. So I think there's been a few motions recently about teaching kids quite intense things. So like at Imperial, there was a motion about teaching them techniques for sexual gratification in schools. And then at Doxbridge, there was one about teaching them in schools that they are responsible, that they are personally culpable for death and suffering in the developing world. And then these kind of debates, if you're an op, just really characterizing what the weaknesses of children are such that they can't process this in the way that all of the debate is dependent on and are probably likely to be uncomfortable and traumatized and not get good impacts and a lot of it flows from that right from that characterization of their weaknesses as much as, as their strengths so i think pointing out both sides strengths and weaknesses gives you kind of a nuanced description um lastly is something which i kind of alluded to but it is, are there actors within the actor? Because again, we always tend to treat groups as homogenous in debating and um, we shouldn't. So break down them very clearly. Um, because, so in debates, you know, we talk about like social movements a lot. Um, and realistically, there's not like, social movements are made up of so many different components, like leaders, founders, donors, political parties who are aligned with them, hardcore supporters, sympathizers, the victims of social injustice, which they're protecting, allies um so actually the statement of characterizing one actor is kind of a bit meaningless in that sense so if you can break it down and be very nuanced i think this particularly applies to countries and so something that someone told me which i thought was really really useful is a benchmark you should aim for when characterizing different countries in debates 
is try to be able to talk about the country that you're characterizing with the same level of detail or nuance that you do when you talk about your own country. And if you manage that, you're doing something well. And this doesn't require a high degree of knowledge, right? It's about the way that you frame the ideas that you're talking about. So for example, when I'm talking about the UK doing anything, I very rarely say like the UK did this, the UK did that. I'd always be like Boris Johnson did this, Dominic Cummins did this, the treasury did this. Um, but when I talk about countries I know less about, I tend to treat them as more homogenous. So I'll be like, China did this, Russia did this. Um, but realistically, the way to be more nuanced is to think about other countries in the same kind of institutional sense that you probably do think about your own and try and differentiate that. So that's kind of a good benchmark to make. Um, even if it's just linguistically, I think talking about like how the Kremlin will behave just is more persuasive and just sounds a lot more nuanced than like how Russia will behave. Um, because like Russia didn't really do anything, Putin probably did it as the Kremlin. So just try and have that level of nuance, which I think is really helpful. I also think the reason why this point is also important is because characterizing different actors like this is a very useful tool for matter generation. So again, I'll, I'll give an example. If you are in a debate about Pakistan and you're making arguments about Pakistan generally, you might come up with like one or two arguments. Um, but if you break down that actor, which is the country into talking about political parties, the army, and the religious right. You've just generated so many more arguments. And you can go down further still. You can talk about each specific party. You can talk about competing factions in the military. You can talk about the difference between religious moderates and religious extremists. And when you've done that, you've just multiplied the number of arguments and impact you have like almost exponentially because there's just so many categories. So I think nuanced characterization helps you access more arguments as well as make the arguments that you're saying more believable. I just think the thing to see out in here is that you have to be very, very clear in differentiating which part of an actor you're talking about at any one point. Otherwise, it can kind of become a bit confusing if you're like moving between different different factions. So just be very clear in the language you're using to make sure the judge is following the roadmap of which um, factions you're talking about at any one point. The last thing to say about this is that we think about unboxing actors in terms of breaking them down. Um, but you can also kind of go a step above them. So in the same way that you can be like Pakistan, political parties, factions within political parties, minorities within factions of political parties, you can also be like Pakistan, South Asia, Asia, global, you know, glo global order, basically. Um, so you can go above and below the actors. And if you're characterizing kind of all three spheres, that is even more powerful. So for example, in like IR debates, you generally want to talk about the actor itself, obviously, what its interests are. Um, regional stability, which is going above the actor, and then domestic stability, which is going below the actor. And if you're consciously characterizing all of these levels, that's gonna be a lot more plausible and powerful than just focusing on the actor and not like, you know, having more, more diversity in the angles from which you're considering it. So that's really important. So given this information about thinking about actors in different ways, strategic characterization has to recognize this and then either A, point to common trends amongst all of them, despite differences. So um, what do all of the different parts of government all share? What capacities and interests do they share despite their differences? And then you're still showing like common incentives, but you're being more nuanced in the way you do it. Um, or select the ones which are most critical to your case or the opposition's case, whatever, and explain why. So you can select leaders, donors of political movements or social movements, and then explain why they have the biggest impact. And we should care about them in the debate more than anyone else. And that's how you get your license to then like characterize them in a lot more detail than anyone else did, um, which is particularly important. I think an example of like this was um, in the Doxbridge motion this weekend, round five was about social movements shaming people who aren't socially conscious or aren't taking socially conscious accents, um, accents uh, actions. And then basically what each side has to do is pick the group that they care about most and characterize them as the most important. Um, so on prop, you probably want to say the people who aren't already sympathetic to social movement are less important, they're not going to be swayed. This is given that most people now sympathize with social movements and they're quite mainstream. This is about ensuring compliance among the people who already have sympathy. And therefore, if you characterize why they have the most impact and they have the most power and I'll go through all the reasons I just gave you, then you can make the debate about that. Whereas on op, it's much easier to talk about people who could join the movement who won't be. So basically just be specific about who you're talking about and who you're characterizing at any one point. And then for each individual actor, go through like the checklist of like questions I, I've just gone through about like capacities, incentives, what are they like, thought processes, decision making process, et cetera. Um, because you'll just generate so much characterization, which is really, really useful. The next thing, is still on the checklist of characterization. Um, 
think very consciously about what terms you want to use. And I think this is definitely underrated because we talk about, you know, in BP, like we're not judged on style, um, but language has so much power and so like has massive connotations over the frame of reference through which your arguments are perceived. So you try and be careful about the words you use. And the best way to do this is just to practice, like is to get, get in motion, um, try and like practicing coming up with the right language or introductions or characterization that you want to do um, so that you kind of get into the mindset of being able to be like this is the idea I want to communicate I'm confident that I can you know think of the correct ways to frame this idea um so it's things like if you're if it's the debate's about an intervention are you invading and bombarding or are you defending and protecting through targeted strikes like those are very different things um if it's a debate about pushing people to certain choices um are you coercing and manipulating or are you nudging and encouraging? Because these are like two sides of the same coin. Um, but depending on which side you're on, definitely try and make the characterization sound as rhetor rhetorical as possible to make your side sound very, very intuitive. Because I think a lot of characterization is about capturing intuition and just making sure the intuition falls on your side where it might not otherwise, or where you might be more vulnerable. Okay, so this is kind of how I think you should do the description part of characterization. I do think there is an important caveat here, which is that not all things in the debate need described equally. Um, and this can be pretty arbitrary, right? Because in, in debates, we all kind of have assumptions which we share, generally very like liberal assumptions and intuitions. And I think it's quite smart to make sure that you're consciously very tuned in to the assumptions and intuitions which the debate community have, and then you're able to weaponize them. Um, and then know what things need to be proven and what things don't. Um, so for example, if you're talking about like institutions being racist or you know problematic or discriminatory you don't need to waste a lot of time going over the top kind of characterizing this because chances are probably no one's going to contest it and the judges are going to believe it actually this links to this another question that i received on the google forum which i thought was really good which was how do you know you're not overdoing characterization why is it absolutely necessary and when can we assume that people know it so the first one is kind of tr use intuitions about what the um the debate community believes, but I realize that's hard to quantify. So I did think about it and I have two questions that I think you should ask yourself to know if you should keep characterizing. The first one is, would it be strategic or could it be strategic for any other team in the debate to contest this characterization? So is there a world in which the other teams, including your closing, will want to contradict you and say that this characterization isn't important? If the answer is yes, definitely characterize more until you're sure. Um, I think you're better to be on the side of caution and characterize more than characterize less because generally people don't do it enough. So you really have to push yourself beyond what you think is intuitive and um, to make sure that it stands. Um, yeah, you might like be repetitive, but as long as you're like, don't be repetitive, but as long as you're adding new things, I think it's hard to over characterize if you think it is strategically important in the round. So that's the first question. And if the answer is yes, characterize more. But if the answer is no, no one's going to contest it. I still think there's a second question you have to ask yourself, which is, is the importance of your case dependent on this characterization? If the answer is no, don't characterize, it's not significant. If the answer is yes, definitely still do it a bit. So don't waste as much time hammering this point in um, because no one's gonna contest it. But if it matters so that your case sticks in the debate, you still have to do it so you can claim impacts. So a good example of this is a debate we did recently in a spar, which is this house would force all defendants in criminal trials to use a public defender. And the thing is that probably no one in that debate is likely to contest that public defenders are inefficient and bad and terrible in the status quo. Likely is no likely no one is likely to contest that private lawyers give you massive advantages and give you lots of privilege and power over the system. So it's not going to be contested. But I think according to the second question, you still need to characterize that situation because a lot of the points on government about fairness, about the principle, about the access and equality under the legal system aren't strong unless you characterize why the status quo is so terrible. Um, so likely the debate is going to become about how to make the status quo less terrible and all, are going to concede that the status quo is terrible, but all the kind of principles that you're saying are still dependent on this being like a horrible, horrible, horrible moral situation, which is so undesirable that we have to do it. So you still have to ground it a bit to make sure that your impacts don't just fall out of the debate um, and that you get to claim those impacts most importantly and that your closing don't stand up and then say, um, you know, they haven't characterized what the problem is and we're going to do that. Um, so those are the two questions that I think you should answer to ask yourself whether you have to characterize more. Um, yeah, if, if that doesn't answer your question, feel free to like ask again um, and I'll have another think, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that's kind of helpful. Again, I kind of want to reiterate what I said before, which is that that is quite an intricate, those are quite intricate strategic questions. Um, so 
I don't think it's helpful to just practice them in 15 minutes prep or in debates. I think you should give yourself a set of motions, go through them for each of them, think about what the characterization would be and answer those two questions and see what you can come up with. Because I think you need to give yourself more time to go through kind of all the thought processes and all the steps of working out what effective characterization is and when you need it and when you don't need it so that you develop intuitions so that then when you're in time constraints debates, you're able to do it. Um, but I think like just doing it in debates makes you incredibly vulnerable because it's hard to go through all the kind of questions that I'm saying and nuances in that restricted time period. So allow yourself to develop the skills in a more free way is basically what I'm saying. Okay, so that was the description part of characterization. That's part number one. I think part number two is the justification part, which is uh, something people do struggle with a lot, I think, and I struggle with this a lot, which is giving reasons to back up your characterization. And that means doing analysis, because I think often we assume like analysis is just for arguments, but like characterization is a form of argument and definitely needs al analysis to justify it um, and to go behind it. Um, to make sure that it's justified and make sure it's accepted in the debate. Um, so even things that you think are intuitive, if there's a chance that they'll be contested, you still need to give reasons. Um, so for example, this is another debate that was recently, again, um, was at Doxbridge at the weekend. You can tell that I wrote it this week because these motions are in my head. Um, but there, in the semi-final was about um, democracy in developing countries. So it is you have to justify. So if we were on the side of wanting technocracy, not democracy, um, and I think you do have to explain why democracy in developing countries is likely to be weak and characterize why that's why that's bad. Um, and I think justifying that characterization is a necessary but insufficient way to make that characterization stick in this debate and to make it part of the argument. Um, so like, even if this is quite obvious, you think it's something which most people will believe, um, like ground it so that it can't just be contested because teams do just contest things that are intuitive because that's kind of the point in debate where we argue with logic. We don't, we're not meant to just go with intuition. And um, so you should try and justify it so that you get the intuition, but you also have the logical basis. And um, so for example, we gave reasons like democracies in developing countries will be weak because um, one, the inheritance of a pre-colonial elite means you don't develop like self-sufficient institutions because they've had too much control. And um, two, often like the reason development was stilted is because of recovery from like ethnic tensions or civil wars, which make, means problem with law and order, which means there's an implementation gap with institutions. Um, thirdly, the impact of neoliberal institutions like the IMF and the World Bank um, have like stilted the self-sufficiency of institutions further and create a dependency culture. And then fourthly, like general trends of illiteracy and lower access to technology and communication mean that the kind of scrutiny culture and democracy can't be strong. Um, and you can like go through these, these reasons quickly, um, but you still need to have them to make sure you're justifying that characterization um, and make it like not as assertive as possible. Um, and I think in this justification, yes, you can always leverage analysis this about how people will respond to like a net message or a narrative by thinking about who is sending the message who's receiving it whether they'll internalize it and you can give reasons to justify why that will happen so for example if you're in a debate about like banning violent video games you say students play violent video games and then they want to get into fights and then they'll all be violent and that's a you want to paint that characterization of kids as impressionable and vulnerable and um, but you need to justify it by being like yeah they're impulsive they're impressionable they want excitement and they want to impress their friends they're vulnerable to peer pressure they don't have like a clear sense of morals developed because they're younger um, and these are the reasons why that characterization of kids is true right um, and the kind of experiences they have um i think like listing reasons to show kind of an overwhelming pattern is quite effective um or like go into reasons quite detailed in quite detailed way. Um, but basically just like, don't just give one reason why your characterization is true because you're, you're very vulnerable to it being rebutted. So you wanna think of a few reasons why your characterization definitely holds, which makes it much more likely to stick in the debate. Um, and that's really important. So basically just force yourself to come up with structural reasons that aren't like dependent on what you've already said or aren't just assertions about why this is likely to be true. Um, because, and also remember when you're giving your justification, you're still being comparative. So in the same way that nothing in debate is good or bad, it's always better or worse. Nothing is like true or untrue. It's always more plausible or less plausible. So your justification, it, it, ideally you should try and be comparative of why it's more likely or in more cases it's likely to be the way, the way you say it than the other teams say it. That's the kind of justification part, which is the structural reasons to back up the description, which you've already done. Um, the third part is then implications which I think people do even less than they do justifications often. So what are the implications of this characterization you've given on the other teams in the debate? 
What are the implications to your case? Which arguments does it make strong? Which arguments does it take down? Which arguments does it rebut? Because I think often teams think when they've characterized this, it kind of like takes on arguments automatically, but you just have to make things very, very clear so that all the judges are confident, like what your strategy is and what the implications of that characterization were. Otherwise it kind of becomes a bit of a waste of time um, or like doesn't have the impact that it could do. Um, yes, and I think this kind of comes from people, inclu like, including me when I was learning to do this, like characterizing as a separate portion of their speech and making it detach from the arguments because it's the easiest way to make it formulate and to force yourself to do it. Um, but I think the more you connect those two things, so say, this is my characterization, this is what it means for my arguments, is the way that you're able to weaponize that most effectively. And that's quite a big difference there. So what could the implications be? Let's just go through these. So first of all, is kind of what we talked about at the start, which is, I think, the most obvious implication, which is that it makes your argument plausible. They'll react in this way, impact will happen, it kind of unlocks an area of the debate, so that's useful. Um, I think the second one, is main one, is probably weighing. So characterizing an actor as particularly vulnerable, or means that you care about them more, or maybe characterizing an actor as particularly dangerous or unstable, again, makes you care about them more because they're more of a risk in the debate. So the, the stakes are very high. So plausibility and weighing are definitely implications which you can draw from characterization. Once you've described and justified your characterization, you then say, therefore, they're the most vulnerable, so you should care about them for these reasons, um, or therefore the most dangerous, so they're the highest change in this round. Um, there's a few other ones, I think. Hang on. The third one, after like plausibility and weighing, is that I do think characterization can be used to shift burdens. And what I mean by that is, as well as characterizing the status quo as it is right now, you can also characterize the trajectory under the status quo. And those are quite different things. But if you manage to characterize this trajectory in the status quo, it often changes what the debate's about and what impact you're trying to claim. Because often you're trying to prevent something rather than just to like get something positive. Um, okay, I'll, I'll give an example because maybe that was quite clear, I think. Um, so this is, again, a motion that was, that was recent, which was about the EU sanctioning Israel for building settlements. And what we did is characterize why the trajectory of the Israeli right right now was more aggression and more settlements. And hence the burden of the debate isn't like to achieve peace or achieve positive benefits beyond what's happening now, but it's to prevent the escalation, which is inevitable under the status quo and to stop things which are going to happen. And I think that's a way to characterize the context, which actually lowers the burden for Gov, because you don't have to prove positive change in the status quo. You have to prove that if we don't intervene, the status quo will get worse. And so we have to like keep it at zero, which is really effective. Um, again, we did a debate recently about like North Korean nuclear disarmament. And part of, part of what we did was arguing why the trajectory was escalation of um, North Korea right now. And hence we have to change the current trajectory and um, rather, the, which, which stops the characterization from off of saying like, you know, sanctions are working and we should keep them. So basically characterization informs the way the debate is fought and the context which, within which the debate happens. And if you weaponize that properly, you can change the burdens of the debate to the ones which are like easiest to get for your side or most high impact, whatever, basically are like strategically beneficial for your side. Um, so the main thing here is characterize the trajectory, not just what the status quo is right now, which gives you more flexibility about what's up for grabs in the debate, what, what is the end goal you're trying to achieve with your case, for example, that is particularly important. Um, yeah. Okay, so now I've kind of explained, so that's kind of the three parts, which are um, description, justification, implications, all of which should be very explicit. Um, so like, okay, I'm gonna justify why this characterization is true, I'm going to tell you what the implications are just to make sure the judge is totally clear of what you're doing and that you're being very transparent about your strategic direction, which I which I think is really important for um, clarity, because often I, I definitely found this often I was doing like smart strategic things in my head and then no one else was understanding and I was like why, but it's because I didn't label the stages of what I was doing as clearly so that's my big tip when you're going through these three stages just to make sure it's totally clear what you're doing. But the next question is kind of like how to use this in a speech which is the hardest bit because you can you can answer all the questions I've given, you can do prep motions, but then if you can't integrate it into your speeches, it, it becomes difficult to then get credit from it. Um, the first thing that I would just point out is that the end goal of learning all this is to collapse the distinction between characterization and arguments, because realistically arguments need characterization integrated into them to be plausible. If you're able to illustrate a picture throughout your whole speech, um, it's much more effective than just like doing it at the start and then 
giving mechanisms and having those this detached thing. So that's the first thing to point out. But I recognize doing it at the start is often a useful stepping stone because it forces yourself to do it. Um, but I actually think the most valuable piece of advice I ever got about characterization, which made a big difference to the way I prep motions, is making your first whole argument about characterization is such an effective strategy. And this kind of blew my mind more than it should have, because I was like, but it's not an argument. Why would you make your first argument if it's not an argument? But characterization often functions as arguments. I think especially in debates which are very broad, so the concepts are abstract. Um, it's not really clear what the debate's about. You have to ground it a lot. Having your whole first argument about, I'm gonna characterize what this thing is and explain why that's important. It's just a really, really good idea. And then your next two points can be like, I'm talking about PM and LO predominantly, um, but then your next points are about the impacts which stem from that characterization. I just think this is a brilliant idea and it makes debates so, so, so much clearer. Um, I'm gonna give some examples because again, this is quite abstract, but um, so I'm talking about Doxbridge again, because it just happened, but it, I thought a lot about characterization at this competition. And um, so the quarterfinal motion was, this house regrets the glorification of the concept of genius. So we were oppos opening opposition. And then when we prepped, our first argument was literally just like, what is the genius? And um, why is that significant? And we built a very kind of, it was aiming to be detailed. I'm not sure how successful it was, but um, it was aiming to be detailed. It was saying why, um, why is a genius? Why is it different to what OG said? Because OG kind of talked about a genius as being like a highly intelligent person, um, which is fair. But then we were like, no, genius is more than that. It's about some kind of magical quality, which is like, it's almost irrational believing in genius because it, it, it transcends all kind of rational structures or like rational, you know, performance targets. Like people do terribly in school, but then ends up geniuses after. Um, so that's particularly important. Um, and then the implications of that were one, a lot of OG became symmetric because it was about highly intelligence rather than the specific characterization of genius that we built. Um, and secondly, we were able to flip a lot of government impacts about who was able to access genius by saying the fact that a genius is something which is so powerful that it goes beyond rational constraints is the only way that you're able to get like minorities or women to be able to access any credibility in field like you know science, math, technology, which you otherwise wouldn't get. But the fact that we spent a whole point kind of building that, I think made the debate a lot clearer and made the terms of the debate a lot clearer because we were like, we're gonna spend a good couple of minutes like being very clear about what this is, painting a picture, describing, justifying, doing implications before we even did any impact or any arguments. And I think that's a really good, really, I find that really useful. Obviously you might disagree, but I think it's really, really helpful. Um, another example of a motion where I think this is very helpful is the Thai world, I think it was the octofinal, I'm not, I think it was the octofinal, but the motion about um, like positive versus negative perceptions of democracy. So like pessimistic, it was like prefer the world where there's a pessimistic and cynical perception of democracy versus um, an optimistic and idealistic one. And in a motion like that, definitely spend a whole first argument explaining what the world looks like. What do these terms actually mean? not in like a literal definition it's not it's not like you're defining the terms but you're just explaining painting a picture of what they play out so in practical terms so for example for like cynical and pessimistic you'd be like well this is a realistic perception of democracy so you're going to be strategic you're going to be like very critical you're going to be cautious you're not going to be easily fooled you're probably still going to be engaged because you know politics is a threat to you but you know the other avenues of social change are necessary um, because democracy can't solve everything. So you're going to engage more critically in democracy and you're also going to find other avenues to engage in because you don't put all your trust in democracy. That's how you might characterize it from prop. Versus an op, you might define cynical and pessimistic as like disengaged, disenfranchised. You don't hold anyone accountable because you've given up. You think it's a lost cause. Um, there's no point in pushing it to be better. You get worn down. Um, you get fatigued, you're just not interested, versus on the comparative, idealism endures despite like rational concerns, but it cause you to give up, so you're just more engaged, um, more hopeful, and therefore you invest more in the system. So again, these are like, all the things I've said there aren't really arguments, they're just descriptions of what the words in the motion mean. But if you make that a whole first argument, it's just really, really, really powerful. Um, but it's not just in these type of motions. I think this is where it's most powerful, but you can also do it in policy debates. Um, so an example, which I think stood out quite clearly to me where characterization really matters was the imperial motion I've already talked about, which was around one, it was about teaching children techniques for sexual gratification in schools as part of sex ed. Um, and this is a debate where the first thing you have to do is definitely characterize what that looks like and make sure the intuition falls on your side. So for example, on prop, you want to be characterizing why it will be done well. So you want to say, you know, schools are safe spaces. There's lots of trust between teachers. Kids are free to ask questions. They're less embarrassed if they get given information rather than having to like look it up by themselves and admit they're, you know, interested. 
um, so they don't feel as ashamed because it's just normalized in school because nothing in school is particularly like shocking. Um, that's a kind of comparison on GUP, but on OP, you probably want to do a first point being like, what does this look like? Um, so, you know, on OP, we said like in any other circumstance where an adult, especially in a position of power, talks to a child about graphic sexual content they didn't consent to or feel ready for, like we think of that as harassment, like this is going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be traumatic, especially when kids have a bad relationship with the education system and the education teacher, it's going to make them feel terrible, it's going to give them unhealthy attitudes towards sex. Um, so this characterization of like an empowering experience versus being trapped in an uncomfortable experience, if you paint those pictures effectively, then all of the other arguments in the debate about whether it really good or bad are so much clearer because you know what it will actually look like and then you have to contest what it will look like. So I think just making your first point about characterization is a really good way of forcing yourself to do all these strategies, um, which hopefully I think will make your speeches a lot stronger. Um, it definitely did for me, I think it helps. The next thing I guess is given this, how do you practice characterization? And honestly, the thing that I would emphasize is don't just do it in debates. Um, someone gave me, said a metaphor once, which I thought was, it really stuck with me, which is like, you know, sports players don't just get better by playing matches. Like if you're a football player, you don't just play matches at training, you practice individual skills. So you practice like dribbling or scoring or strategy or defending kind of running out of things that footballers do, but they have a lot of different skills that they practice individually uh, through drills. And I think, I think it's much more powerful if you do the same in debating, which means give yourself 15 minutes of prep, that's fine. And then prep emotion and give a speech, but only focus on characterization and only judge yourself based on characterization so that you get good at that specific skill before you try and integrate it into all your other skills. That, that's the main thing that I would say. Um, but then uh, the second advice, which I keep reiterating, but I think it's really important is don't just do it in debates. Don't just do it in like prep, sorry, like prep, 15 minutes prep, do it without time constraints. So you can talk through all the possible ideas, all the possible ways of characterizing actors, all the different actors you can characterize, work out what's strategically beneficial. And then when you can do that in a very flexible way, when you can do it perfectly with no time constraints, then you give yourself time constraints and then you start getting better at it. But you just have to kind of hone the intuitions, I think, which a lot of this stuff is dependent on. The next thing I would want to say about using characterization in debates is that kind of everyone knows that you're supposed to characterize from opening and teams who are aware of it generally do. Um, but I think as a circuit, often I've noticed that people are doing it a lot less from closing. And I just think it's such an ideal way to be able to like massively increase your team significance in the round. If everyone else just debated arguments and assumed they were debating about the same thing and you were like, no one's actually characterized what this looks like or how it's going out. Um, I think often that is what makes a massive difference between you and your opening or you and your opposing bench. It's just painting a picture for the judges because they're going to be like, thank God, someone's explained to me what this actually means. It's not just like a list of reasons about all the impacts that this will have. Um, so I think, definitely make sure that if your opening haven't done it you co-opt it and do that in closing and I would also say definitely critique your opening for not doing it and point out that they haven't done it because it's a useful way to weigh against them being like all of OG's mechanisms are contingent on this actor having this quality and therefore acting in this way but they didn't actually characterize why that's true we did so therefore everything is contingent on us or OG said this was the most important actor but they didn't actually characterize what's so specific about the actor why they're so vulnerable or powerful or whatever and therefore, this is something that we're going to contribute. So definitely, I think, co-op that. People can co-op that a lot more than they do in terms of winning debates. Um, OK. The next thing, oh, hang on, a question. How do you contest characterization? Uh, that's a good question. I do have a section on rebut like rebutting characterization, so I will get to that later. Um, that's a really useful question. Um, so I'm going to say now how to weaponize characterization. So I've talked about weighing, I talked about plausibility. I think one thing, and this is, I think this is probably one of the points which is more controversial. So some people might disagree with me. This is a strategy I like using, but some people might not, is that you don't only have to characterize to win a clash. You can also characterize to neutralize certain clashes. So I agree when people say that you shouldn't lie in characterization to the extent that you shouldn't lie about what other teams have said which is what we call straw manning. So definitely don't lie about what other teams are defending because that's just bad debating, it's annoying. Like straw manning is awful, judges won't like it. But I don't think you should concede characterization which helps the other side just because you think it's intuitive or just because you think it's accurate to what the real world looks like because you're just giving the other team a slam dunk if they're able, like motions often aren't perfectly balanced although we'd like to think they are. And um, if you just concede something because you think it's intuitive and or true, then 
the other team just kind of like automatically wins because they got all the impact that flow from it. So I think that even if you can't win, you don't think you can win on a characterization, I definitely think it's worth giving a counterintuitive characterization because it means that the other side have to work a lot harder to be able to claim their characterization because they have to rebut you, they have to deal with you as opposed to them just being like, this is how it is, no one, everyone else accepted it, so it's fine. Um, I think if you're too defensive, um, that kind of hurts you and often like, you know, like the thing in sport about like the best form of defense that ta is offense. Like, I think that's kind of true in the sense that if you push a characterization, even if you think it, it is less intuitive, um, it's still important to do because it makes it harder for the other side to beat you. The thing which I will point out here is that given that in characterization is a lot about intuition and intuition is like very culturally informed. So like what is intuitive in the European circuit is not intuitive in a lot of other debate circuits or a lot of communities in the world. And um, interestingly, so I'm from Scotland, my partner Hamza is from Pakistan, and often we look at motions and just have wildly different intuitions about how the debate will play out and what side it's kind of biased towards. Even though we have similar political leanings, our frame of reference is so different. So just like, don't be afraid to defend things that you think are counterintuitive um, because it can still help you clean ground over the other side. But if you're doing it, A, obviously don't be obviously stupid and assert things that like the average intelligent voter would just know are nonsense. There's a difference between being counterintuitive and being like, too crazy and a bit silly. Um, so just make sure you're not towing that line. But secondly, if you are saying something that you think is gonna come across as counterintuitive to the judges, it's even more important that you give structural reasons why that's true and be like, the other side is relying on intuition and your conception of the world. We're giving you logical reasons why the, our, our characterization is true. So they have to engage with that. So just frame it so it's much more about the logical reasons you're giving um, than just about intuition. But thirdly, and I think really importantly, point out to the judge that their intuition is probably with the other side because often like in debates, we just hear things and then we give credibility to certain ideas or certain characterizations because we're so normalized, we're so biased in thinking certain things, which isn't really fair because you should be able to win a debate from any side, any kind of political leaning, any intuition. So just point out, you know, this is what we're more intuitive, that we're more like intuitively inclined to believe, but this is what we're, this, it, it's not this and then give the counter one. And I will talk in a bit, in a minute about how to rebut like strong characterization, which is quite important. Um, I think an example here to maybe again clarify this is in the debate, I think I already talked about actually, but I'll talk about it more, about um, technocracy versus democracy in developing countries. I think intuitively the characterization of democracy is really important and giving people access to representation is really strong on op. Um, but in opening government, we said, firstly, democracies in developing countries tend to be captured by the elite, which is basically to wash gov when they say democracy is minorities only access to power, which is probably true, but we characterize it as them having basically no access just to make it harder for opt to claim that benefit. And second of all, we characterize the right to democratic participation as just not that important. We characterize democracy as a Western construct imposed on developing nations through colonial rule. We said people don't care about voting in much in elections every five years as, as like they do. Um, compared to their day-to-day -day lives. And like, for me, obviously I'm coming from a European circuit with a lot of biases that felt incredibly counterintuitive, um, but A, do it anyway, because it makes it hard for the other side to fight against. And then B, recognize that is not counterintuitive for a lot of people in the world. So just be, I guess, more open to like playing around with intuition, pointing out where intuition is and trying to capture it on your side. Um, don't be afraid to like do things to neutralize a clash that you think might go to the other side. Um, Obviously, then you then give structural reasons and arguments to follow that, but I think often that characterization and framing is critical in just making sure that the other side can't win on intuition bumps. Um, the next bit is answering this question, which just came through, which is even if you don't do this preemptively, well, first, okay, don't just, so use characterization to rebut arguments. So if they give a really complex argument and they have just so many mechs, you can't rebut all of the mechanisms, maybe you don't even understand all of the mechanisms, that happens to me quite a lot. Um, just point out, you know, all of the impacts and all of the way or this situation behaving in this way, and then say that's not true. I'm going to characterize why, and then go through the like description, justification, implications thing, which I talked about before. But like, you can use characterization as rebuttal as well as just positive material, and I think that's something which. I've noticed teams don't weaponize as much. We tend to rebut just the mechanisms, but we often don't use characterization as a way to be destructive and as a way to compare. So that's important. But this is the bit that answers the question, sorry, which is how to rebut characterization. Um, okay, so a few things. First of all, um, if the other team don't rebut your characterization, definitely point this out. Note that they didn't engage with it. 
and therefore, you know, they're not contesting it. The assumption is it's kind of true and holding the debate if no one contests it. So make a big deal if no one rebuts your characterization, um, especially in a motion about like abstract concepts, because if you don't define and characterize straight away, it just, it's unreasonable to do so later because the debate becomes so messy. Not that it's like against the rules, it just makes it much harder. So just be like, we characterize it as this, they never contested it, give reasons why that's even more true. But more importantly, to rebut their characterization, there's a few steps you should take. First of all, is to explicitly acknowledge that characterization, because often characterization, like the, the power, I think I said this at the start, but the power it has is very subconscious um, in terms of the way it changes your frame of references about arguments. So often judge won't, well, judges won't consciously be like, I believe the argument because of this characterization. Often they'll just believe the argument, but it will be because of the characterization. So when you're abutting characterization, you have to point out what it was and make it explicit. Be like, they tried to characterize this group as X. That's the first step. It's really important so that it doesn't just become something that's assumed in the debate. Second one is obviously then just like explicitly contradict their characterization and give a counter characterization. Um, so this isn't true because, and then give your characterization. Um, and then you're showing why it's more true or better on your side. So again, it's not about true or untrue. It's about more plausible or less plausible. So give your characterization and then say why it is more true. Um, and then you can do things to like, um, make this more persuasive so for example Paul po pointing out like logical holes or bizarre implications in their characterization um using rhetoric to add emphasis are kind of good ways to do this um but once you've given your positive characterization just compare that to the reasons that they gave why their characterization was effective and then rebut those reasons because there's a difference in giving a counter characterization and actually rebutting their characterization. And often the way to do that is look at the structural reasons they gave and just rebut those like you would normal mechanisms or rebuttal. Um, so definitely like use arguments to be like, this is a logical because, um, they can't assume this because. Um, so do two things, like rebut the reasons they gave, but also give a positive characterization yourself and then compare why that is more plausible or more likely to happen. You can do that why it's just generally more plausible. You can also, I think something which is actually very nuanced and can work is just saying like, this is obviously happens in multiple different situations. Um, their conception of how this actual will behave happens in these situations. This set of situations is smaller or less powerful or less significant. And therefore what this debate is actually about is where the biggest change takes place or the biggest impacts take place, which is in my set of, of, um, of like countries or groups or people or whatever. Cause I do think a problem with like characterization and debates is that often teams just to end up debating like different groups of countries. So I think in any motion about developing countries, for example, like it's, it's weird that we just bunch together all these countries which have very different economies, very different political structures, are just different countries in their entirety, but yet we have motions about developing countries. So often one side will characterize one class of developing countries and the other side will characterize a different class. And the way to deal with that situation is to explicitly point out that you're talking about different scenarios and then justify to the judge why your group of scenarios is the most important um, in two ways. One, positive reasons why your group is most important. And then two, negative reasons why their group is least important. So for example, maybe there are extenuating factors which will impact their countries or their groups or whatever more than anything that's changing in the debate will. Maybe a lot of it's symmetric. Maybe they're already in a trajectory to change. So the difference is minimal. So yeah, those are the two things that you can do to rebut that. Um, that's how to rebut characterization. But this is kind of where I give a big caveat, which kind of detaches from what I said so far, which is that obviously you should rebut the characterization and give your characterization. But when you're giving positive arguments, don't rely too much on your conception of the debate. Because honestly, the biggest danger of everything that I've said is that teams don't clash with each other because they're so set in their own specific world that they've painted that they don't engage with the other team's world and they just become completely dependent on their characterization. So the best thing to do is to engage in both teams' worlds, both characterization, not just as a, like a one-liner, like, oh, even in their best case, this happens, but like substantively have like a second argument, which is like, even if their characterization is true, we can still win on our side for these reasons. And if you do that, even if thing, it just kind of insulates you because even if the judge doesn't buy your characterization and your main impact, hopefully they do, but if they don't, you're still insulated because even if they buy the other side's characterization, your argument still functions within it, which is really, really important. So take them at their best. Um, that, that's the kind of the last step of rebuttal. So you're about the characterization with all the reason, ways I've just said, and then you say, even if their characterization is true, I'm gonna rebut the argument and show the impacts that will happen even in their world. And that's really important to make sure that you're not just having like a, uh, 
a very kind of narrow conception of the debate and that you're actually engaging in all ways. Um, yeah, because you don't want to be contingent. I think the main thing to do, the main advice here is you just have to be very, very, very clear. Be so explicit. When you're talking about your world, when are you talking about your world? When you're talking about their world, when are you talking about their world? Like label very clearly to the judges what the strategic calls you're making are at each portion of your speech. Otherwise it can be confusing if you're trying to engage in like three characterizations, which is a smart thing to do, but you're not labeling when you're moving between them. I think that's how often teams try to have very complicated nuanced strategies, which are brilliant, but they don't get the credit for it because it's just not clear to the judges when they're jumping between different worlds and different characterizations. So definitely label it, label it very, very clearly. Um, I do think that a kind of good way to make sure that you're doing this is thinking about best case and worst case. So in my head, I always did this where I was like, I always have to try and win in the best case of government. So even if their characterization is true and the worst case of mine, which is if my characterization isn't true, if it's first present pr premise isn't true, what's the worst case for my side and still win on that. And that's important because when you just focus on like examples and context, often teams end up debating the most extreme version of that phenomenon or that context rather than thinking generally about how this thing plays out. So if you can be very clear about even in the like least extreme or most extreme example, depending on like which side you're on, if it's good or bad, um, for each side, even in, like the least extreme example, why do you still win? Even in the most extreme example, why do you still win? That's really important to make sure that you're insulated against just being contingent on like one conception of the debate that the judges might not buy. So it's kind of like an insurance policy almost. Um, yeah, so when you're abutting characterization, acknowledge it, contradict it, show why it's comparatively more plausible on your side um, by giving positive characterization, rebut their characterization negatively, say why it's less plausible. And then fifthly, be like, even if it's true, I'm going to win the debate anyway. And that's, if you manage to do that, like you're very likely to place highly in the round because you're engaging on all the possible levels on which the debate takes place, which I think is really, really important. Um, yes. Okay, I am gonna talk briefly about how characterization kind of um, interacts with framing. Because in my mind, we think about characterization as like actors, phenomenon and context involved. But framing is kind of the same skill. It's just thinking about the debate more broadly because framing is like the meta level where you're framing like which issues matter. But the only way you can do that is if you characterize what those issues are like and how they compare against each other. Um, so I think, Framing is often like the level above characterization where you justify having like a bird's eye view of the debate, where the strategic focus of the debate should be. And then you use characterization to like ground that conception home. And um, so I think thinking about these ideas as like totally separate is often kind of counterproductive um, because they, they definitely interweave and like help each other quite a lot. Um, by the actors. Sorry, I'm just checking my notes. I think I said all this. So characterizing situations as well as actors is basically framing. I did see there's a question just come in, so I'm going to read that. Um, okay, this is a good question. So can you talk a bit about specifics of using characterization on closing tables, like how to choose characterization, the implications of which are not in tension with openings case, but are also helpful in placing and weighing higher than that team? Yes, um, that's a really good question. So I think one of the tips that I will say, which I think really helps is that when you're characterizing, you want to do it positively in terms of like, I think teams are just generally good at saying why their arguments are important in a positive sense. Like this is the biggest impact. This is the most vulnerable. This is the most enduring. This is exclusive. Exclusivity is something we should focus on. Um, but I think they're less good at framing certain areas of the debate as less relevant. So I think the way, hang on, let me just check the wording of the question. Um, yeah, so the way to make your framing unique, but not, contradict your openings is not to say that they're like untrue but it's to say that they are not not um not plausible in all cases or don't endure in all cases so they're less relevant so i think a strategy which is often used is like you know openings case is true if this characterization is true but if you kind of think of the debate more broadly there's lots of scenarios in which opposition is correct because there are some examples which don't fit into gov's world because i think often top half teams because you don't have limited time right so it is really hard often get trapped into 
like debating very specific narrow things that they want the debate to be about. And in closing, you can broaden it and say they, it's, they're less relevant because they've neglected like all of these cases and therefore we're going to co-opt them from our, from our side. So in that sense, you're not contradicting opening because you're not like saying they're irrelevant or untrue. You're just saying it's less, less relevant <laughs> to the broader picture, basically. And you can try and broaden that. Um, or on the comparison, if OG is really broad, then in CG, I think a characterization strategy is like, they've talked about the broad picture, but you need to go into the specific actors within them because some are more important. So I think a good example is what I talked about earlier in terms of breaking down different actors and characterizing them. So if OG talk about the impacts on social movements, you can be like, they talked about it very broadly, but social movements are basically controlled by donors and the people that give them money. So they're much more important and then give reasons why they control the trajectory of social movements more than just like a broad nebulous thing. And talk about how they're affected in the debate or leaders or people on the defense or political parties who support them. Like you can basically outframe opening by either going more broad or more narrow and then using that weighing to say why they missed either the big picture or they missed the very concentrated benefit, which is where the, most of the debate hinges and where it lies. And I think that's quite a good way to kind of characterize the situation in a way which benefits your side, um, but doesn't contradict um, contradict opening. Um, I think another way to do this, and this is this is one which I'm very guilty of doing, like too too uh, too sneakily and maybe taking too far, but I do think it's a useful strategy, which is work out what the clashes were on top half and just try to wash both top half teams by saying it's just less relevant, and then. I'll give an example and then give a, a new point or a new characterization that basically just is independent of any clash that happens in top half and therefore kind of like sidesteps all of the issues that they've been trapped into. So I'll give an example of um, an extension that we did this and it worked in this case, which was there was a motion at, I think it was ADU actually, I think it was um, the Asana Euros Prep Comp and it was like this house would incentivize people to work from home. And all of top half, or not, not all of top half, I'm exaggerating here, but a lot of top half was about um, how, which situations do people better work in? Are they more productive? Um, does it help women? Do they have more opportunities? And it was all kind of about individuals and whether they're helped and they have more agency or whether it's harder to work and it's more oppressive. And in closing, we spent like a good few minutes just being like, this clash becomes a bit of a wash. And we gave a few reasons. We were like, firstly, it's very subjective based on what personal preferences are, right? Because some people will like us, some people won't like it. It's a bit symmetric. There's probably even amounts of people on either side, or at least no team has given reasons why their number of people is higher than the people on the other side. So it's a bit uncertain, we can't adjudicate it. But then we said, secondly, a lot of the problems that they're identifying are symmetric in the sense that employers and companies and governments don't want these harms to happen. They don't want women to be oppressed because they have to stay home for kids or they have to go to work and can't look after their kids. Um, they don't want people to be unproductive and have mental health problems at home. So they're gonna create their own solutions to be able to legislate your way out of that problem such that it doesn't become significant on either side, right? Because our logic was like, what open government want is the same thing that companies and governments want. So they're gonna create new policies to kind of help this on either side. And then given that, we just characterized how what working from home and working in an office will be like are dramatically different in different cases based on like different policies that you have based on how much resources you have such that it's really hard to just extrapolate individual benefits from like wildly different circumstances when workplaces are different home setups are different policies and resources that you have are different so i think we had more reasons but off the top of my head that's what i remember but that was basically a strategy not to contradict what we were CEO, so we didn't contradict what oo said we were just like it's just less relevant because it can be mitigated and gov did give reasons why it can be mitigated so it's less true in all cases and they'd like to say and then we said what hasn't been talked about and what isn't contingent on any of the things we said is the macroeconomic benefits so then we ran a whole extension about like downtown economies um you know like the lunchtime economy when people are in the center they you know they use transport and they go to cafes and they buy things and these businesses that aren't accessible in residential areas which boost the service sector and then we characterize that as the most important um you know, we said like service sector workers are the most vulnerable. They can't opt out of being service sector workers almost. They never consented to the incentives that make you work from home and therefore they're most important. So we just characterize the macroeconomic impact as A, the biggest, B, the most certain, and C, impacting the most people. And that, we, we did win this debate. And I think this strategy was, um, it, it like, it, it, it almost becomes dangerously close to rebutting your opening. So you have to just make sure that you're not rebutting them. You're just saying it's not true in all cases, it's contingent. Ours is exclusive and definitely true and has a bigger impact. And then you kind of outframe them in that sense. And I think characterization is a useful way to outframe them, particularly because 
in instances where you're opening rely on specific characterizations and op give another characterization you can be like they're all plausible like it's plausible that working from home will be amazing for these reasons it's plausible that working in an office will be terrible for these reasons but that's symmetric on both sides so just try and wash the classes happen make it less significant and then be like guys i've solved the deadlock i've solved the problem this is what i'm going to do um again like this requires quite a lot of like big kind of strategic thinking so i honestly to practice this kind of thing i really recommend with your partner take time brainstorm emotion come up with an og case or an oo case be like this is what we'd run and then be like okay now take a break and be like if we're closing how would we outframe this um not just in terms of how would we make something that's more important but how would we cast doubt onto the generalizability the exclusivity of that case that we think is the obvious most solid OO case or OG case or whatever. And then from there, you kind of get practiced at making these strategic maneuvers about what's important and what's not important um, and what you should characterize and what you shouldn't characterize. Um, yes, I hope that answers the question. Parti actually, one more thing to add to that. I think a lot of the calculus when you're doing this is being very comparative because when you're characterizing the world, you have to be compared to the, what you're characterizing, which means be very clear what is staying the same, what is symmetric in both worlds, and what specific things are changing, and then characterize that as the most important bit. And I think often this is a way to kind of outframe top half teams because people often forget this and like characterize situations when realistically a lot of the situation stays the same regardless. So if you can be like that symmetric, this is the one very specific thing or one specific actor that we're changing. So in this debate, like I'm talking about, it was like the service sector, although. The macroeconomy effects are not like a small impact, but you know what I mean? It's basically something that is changing when everything else is staying the same. Then you can outframe them in terms of relevance, in terms of exclusivity. And that's even before you do the whole like scale of impact thing, which is kind of the most conventional way to weigh against your opening um, and to kind of outframe them. I hope that answers the question. Um, yes. Um, I That's a really good question. I will think about it. And if I come up with more things, which I probably will, because like PY responses, I always come up with good answers after I've finished. Um, I will post them on the YouTube channel, um, like on the comments and then add things there. Um, equally, if you want to follow up on any of this, um, get in touch, You like message me on Facebook. Uh, my name, it will be on the YouTube, Kira Mitchell, you'll see it on the YouTube title. Um, definitely message me if you have questions or like even if you just have feedback, I'd love to hear anything and um, feel free to chat. Um, otherwise, I guess, you can comment on the YouTube channel and then the like brilliant conveners who set this up will get in touch with me and I'll give you a response. Oh, I see another question. Um, to what extent is knowledge current affairs about certain actors, um, countries, impact over okay yes i see so the question is to what extent does having knowledge impact your characterization skills um it, i mean it depends on the debate so like in a current affairs ir one it has a much bigger impact than a debate about like I don't know things that are more normal so like you know education debates or debates about things that we experience a lot more in real life you can be kind of more creative and it's more freeing because it's not based on knowledge so it's not true for all debates um i think it is helpful and to answer this question i think the main thing here about knowledge about current affairs is that the main thing that will have a bigger impact over your characterization isn't specific knowledge of specific instances, but is like trajectories and patterns and trends over time. So that's the kind of knowledge that you should focus on because I think that has a big impact on characterization. Um, but like specific events, I don't think it does in that instance. I think it's like, it definitely adds value because you can make it more plausible by having knowledge. But as long as you have like a basic understanding and kind of intuitions about how different actors are in relation to each other, who has power, who doesn't, who's allies, like as long as you have a not in detail, but like a kind of basic level, you can always extrapolate characterization from that. And, you know, kind of, you don't want to lie, but you want to, you want to big up the limited facts that you know, and make them, make them very significant and make it seem, you can, you can always deduce things from like one fact, for example, but like who likes who, you can be like, well, therefore they're probably friends with their allies. They probably have political alliances, which they probably negotiate these kind of things. So I think um, it doesn't need to be like specific facts but like a broad knowledge of just how things work and ability to deduce things from a limited set of knowledge is very important to characterization. Um, but the main thing is about broad trends. Um, and again, that's quite specific to IR debates. I think a lot of characterization honestly just requires more creativity than we give it credit for. Um, especially, especially in motions which have been coming up that are very abstract or are like prefers a world where X over Y. Um, I don't think we, often we just, we don't 
we don't think that we have the capacity to be as creative as we do because in debating often we're like we're envisaging worlds which are totally detached from reality in which case you have a lot obviously you have to justify it and not go crazy and but you have a lot of scope to just characterize what this new world looks like and i think in those kind of debates obviously knowledge is not relevant but characterization will exponentially help help your speeches even if you give the same arguments and the same mechanisms like characterizing it makes it much more likely judges will buy it and also give you high speaks because you have to be able to visualize an impact in an argument to be able to like think it has lots of credibility. Um, so in some debates, yes, to an extent. In some debates, no. Um, I hope that answers that question. If not, again, feel free to follow up. Um, yeah, oh, thank you for the nice messages that are coming through. I hope this was helpful. Um, yeah, feel free to follow up with anything. And otherwise, good luck prepping for Euros, I guess. Thanks.